All right, everybody. This is uh, our YouTube channel or podcast or whatever, whatever the future wants it to be. Mm-hmm. Um, we are hungry for moat. Don't <laughs> laugh. It's very clever if you think about it. <laughs> So we were doing Berkshire letters. Uh, we started in 1965 and kind of made it for a few days, for a few years, and then we found out he went earlier letters from his partnership. I think we're gonna do a 1957 letters now. So this will be probably the first video. So you, if you get to the 1955 video, you will probably that will probably be the first video we recorded. So. You can all the awkwardness, true awkwardness, will be there. So, so go <laughs> go watch that one. <laughs> all right, it's me, Prabhat, and my buddy Avinash, super smart guy, the yeah, geek, yeah, really good looking. Okay. Oh, super that. good looking. Oh, yeah, yes. yeah. But that's given. You can look at him. You know. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we. Well, I will. I will let him talk. He has smart things to say. So. Okay, so as usual, you know, we'll kind of look at. Um, all the stuff that was going on in 1957 and um you know go but throw it back to 1957 see what's going on over there and get to the Berkshire Hathaway letter so 1957 letter what was really going on there so Buffett was 27 so the stuff that was ongoing at the time so Japan is fully independent I didn't know but uh, America was at one period of time ruling Japan uh, I didn't know that they had invaded it but um, 1951 Interestingly, so this is again in the 1950s, things that are going on. The first point contact germanium transistors invented. And then in 1959, just a, just eight years, it really seems like a short time, uh, the MOSFET is is invented. What is that? And Oh, so a MOSFET is a metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor. So a fancy way of saying the same uh, transistors that are in operation today but okay. at a very large scale at that period of time. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, so, uh, you know, this point contact is the old school uh, transistor, and then these are like the cool... Is, is the old transistor. school the tube, the vacuum tubes? Is that the old school? Uh, n- no, that, yeah, that pre- predated the transistor. This is still called a transistor, but um, Oh, it's the vacuum tubes were before transistor, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, vacuum tubes were before transistors, yeah. Uh, so, uh, interestingly, also in the 1950s, there's an immunization vaccine that's produced for polio. So, uh, uh, Salk, if you remember, he was the one who invented um, the vaccine for polio. So, wow. uh, Jonas Salk, he, he, that, so, you know, kind of great science going on there. Um, and He's the guy who gave it away for free, right? Yeah, that's what right. What an that's idiot. Right. Like, <laughs> he gave him so much money. <laughs> so much money. <laughs> Um, and also in that scientific realm, there's Francis Crick and James Watson. They discovered the DNA. Of course, Rosalind Franklin, if you if you studied uh, the, the history during that period, she was a huge contributor um, of uh, discovering the double helix structure of the DNA. But of course, she was not recognized as such. So I've put her here. Um, you know, a uh, fascinating story there if you, if you want to read it. Um, Walter Isaacson wrote a fantastic book um, kind of documenting that. but. But really, um, uh, you know, the smart people around, right? There's a uh, general salt, polio, Francis Crick, James Watson, all these people, transistor going on. So kind of cool technology going on. Buffett, still 27. Um, let's see what's going on in particular in 1957. So um, I didn't know this. I don't know if you knew this, but the San Francisco and Los Angeles Stock Exchange merges to form Pacific Coast Stock Exchange. Did you know this? Probably. I didn't even know there was a stock exchange on the Pacific Coast. Yeah. <laughs> Why is there a deficient? Is the New York Stock Exchange? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I didn't know there was anything on the East Coast. I mean, on okay. the West Coast. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, interestingly, January 13th, the first Frisbee, 1957, <laughs> that's when it came about. I doubt it. Media. I mean, <laughs> does, do boomerangs count? <laughs> no, because they come back to you. Frisbee, you need oh, to Frisbees people. don't. That's yeah, I guess one is yeah. a disc and one is a bent object. Yeah. Um, also, January twenty first, Dwight Eisenhower, uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower. Sorry, so he was sworn in. That's so. This is his first year. Um, and Richard Nixon is. Oh, that's sixty eight. I'm sorry, <laughs> that's way back when. Um, uh, that that's uh, that's a typo from from last week. But February nineteen fifty eight to fifty uh, seven to fifty eight. Um, 
this was surprising to me. So influenza pandemic was further identified in China, spreads over to Singapore, reaches Hong Kong in April, and the United States by June, killing at least a million people worldwide. And surprisingly, in all of this, is that it was called the Asian flu. Oh my god. <laughs> Which, this is, is, is it, uh, or, it sounds familiar. <laughs> like, We're reliving history here. Yeah, is this deja vu except for except for like the, the polio is just being discovered in, in form yes. of the inoculation. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, wow. Very similar. So d- March 12th, on to happier news, Dr. Seuss published Cat in the Hat. Um, IBM in April sells the first computer, I mean, first compiler for the Fortran electric programming language. Mm. So uh, very early days of the computing era. October 13th, this I thought was interesting. Toyota begins exporting vehicles in the United States, beginning with um, Toyota Crown and the Toyota Land Cruiser. So you can start to see, um, you know, New Zealand starting to get exports, especially with vehicles um, from Japan. Uh, Toyota's Japan, right? That is great. Yep. And then some famous people that we can kind of relate to, I guess, um, Katie Couric, um, Steve Harvey, also uh, Daniel Day-Lewis, Stephen Fry, Andrew Como, Ray Romano, and Osama bin (laughs) not very friendly to America. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, so, you know, all these guys are are uh, people that we kind of know, but they were just born in that time. So Buffett again, 27. And so let's see what he has to say about um, Berkshire Hathaway in his letters. I thought before I cut over to you again, I thought this would be kind of neat just to show this is kind of what people were looking like if uh, you wanted to look snazzy in the 1950s. Just wow. FYI. I think this yeah. is kind of like... Is, is this the Mad Men era? Like, there's a TV show, Mad Men, with, like, Don Draper. Oh, it I could think be. it's, like, 50s and 60s. I think just ad agencies were the thing. Big Tobacco was, like, you know, super, super profitable. And uh. but I think 50s is, like, you know, they're still growing after... They're still in the boom after the, after the war. Yeah. I think. Uh, I like how the dudes are just like, well, we're just going to stick with the old, <laughs> the same old stuff. Uh, but the, the the girls have kind of changed a little bit, but kind of you know gives you a glimpse of um, I like what it. guys are smart. Like. They don't have to, you know. They're <laughs> like, we don't want to redo the whole thing. Let's just you know, <laughs> snips it maybe more tailored, and then boom, we're done. <laughs> exactly. Um, so let's cut to um, you know maybe you uh, going through the letters. All right, all right. So this is about 1957 yep uh his activities in his limited partnership and i would say he was probably he probably had the best returns of his life during these years and he was managing other people's money and and he has mm-hmm. similar structure to what kind of pub rye has now Mm. Uh, with the small caveat so buffett you know he would guarantee about six percent return Mm-hmm. Uh, which he, from his point of view, that's like basic, you know, what a risk free rate would be on average, I think. So I think that's why he picked 6%. That's how he sees his cost of capital. Mm. And uh, so anything over 6% that he delivers, he would take a quarter percent, mm. the quarter of that. So any and if he made, you know, um, let's say 10% profit, I think he would take a quarter of those four percent over six percent uh, and that scales right so I mean it's a win-win really good incentive structures and yeah. Buffett was ballsy enough where he was like if I do under six percent mm-hmm. I think I will part or if I if I lose money if the stock mm-hmm. goes down then I will like refund you out of my own pocket I mean that mm-hmm. is conviction I mean mm-hmm. Did he, was that really the case? So let's say that there was a downturn a, a, a year or two. He would actually pay back his... Um... I think it probably did if you pull out. I mean, if you didn't, then it probably you know doesn't care. But yeah, yeah. But I, I think so. I think Incredible. that's... Incredible. I mean, wow. Yeah. And, and but mostly, I mean, these were also... I mean, these are not strangers. I think they were like friends, family, neighbors. So I think there's a lot yeah. of goodwill between, between, you know, like who his partners were. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. somehow, I mean, things did get, you know, to a point that he, 
kind of got rid of his partnership uh, late 60s yep. so so some something happened and hopefully yeah we'll see hopefully this will give us an idea of you know that that era where he was probably making 30 percent to 50 percent returns mm-hmm. on our i mean the average year to year yeah. and and he boasts about you know if he was i think around 2000 uh he, he mentioned that if he had a million dollars uh, that I was working with, he could still do fifty percent returns. Mm-hmm. So that that kind of gives little guys like us hope that maybe if we if we kind of follow Buffett's earlier strategies, that mm-hmm. you know, and we are presumably working with smaller sums of money, that we should be able to uh, have extraordinary returns, at least in in theory, at least if we believe in Buffett's thesis. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So let's, let's uh, get, yeah. and also right before we go to the letter, mm-hmm. uh, we should point out he doesn't know Munger yet. So maybe he's heard of him. I mean, they he, worked at I'm not head. sure. I, I I don't know if they've met yet. Okay, at twenty seven. Okay, maybe they haven't met, right? They, they, they definitely have, haven't formed a partner. partner. Oh yeah, yeah. They haven't. I yeah. mean, they they may be pen letters, pen pals, where they yeah. write each other letters and share stock exchange. I know. There's the there's the physician family that that Introduced lends him money to start yeah. this partnership, and mm-hmm. uh, they are neighbors of Munger's family, and they were introduce Munger and Buffett with each, you know with each other like a like a common dinner that they do, and yeah, and that ha- they may have met. I think they're aware of each other's, but but they don't. Mm. They're they're working independently, and Munger mm-hmm. maybe I think is still. Kana with this law firm. Munger is probably 32. They were both yeah. millionaires by the age of 30. So Munger yeah. has done really well with his law practice and his real estate uh, that mm-hmm. he was doing. So independently mm-hmm. wealthy now. Yeah. And uh, and of course, Buffett is not 30 yet, but uh, he will soon know that he is worth more than a million dollars, which was his target. Know, when he was yeah. a teenager, and that's in yeah. like 1950s, 1960s dollars. Mm. Mm. Incredible. Okay, let's get to the All letter. Right. So this is the second annual letter to limited partners for the 19, year 1957. We could not find the first annual letter. Yep. If if you guys know how we can access that, we will we'll love to read that as well. So so here's our 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 plea to the internet. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Here we go. To the three people watching, please, to, if you know. Well, there has to be it's two of us and, and maybe one other person. And I mean, <laughs> obvious is going to be Charlie Munger. It's Absolutely. Like listening to this, so like, oh, these people are incredible. Such <laughs> wisdom. <man. laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Uh, it goes uh, the general stock market picture in 1957. In last year's letter to partners, I said the following. My view of the general market level is that it is priced above intrinsic value. This view relates to blue chip securities. This view, if accurate, carries with it the possibility of substantial decline in all stock prices, both undervalued and otherwise. In any event, I think the probability is very slight that current market levels will be thought of as cheap five years from now. Even a full-scale bear market, however, should not hurt the market value of our workout substantially. That's interesting. He's actually trying to mm. time the market. <laughs> yeah. And I don't I mean, know if he's like, you know, he's young and he's 27 years old, but he, he never makes macro you know, uh, level at least publicly, he never says what he thinks happening macro wise. At least, right? And he doesn't years. care. He doesn't even care about that. It's surprising that he's. But he does say that. He does say that. You know, even like he says, I think it's, it's expensive, and in five years we'll definitely know that it's expensive. He's kind of telling you he thinks it's expensive. Maybe he doesn't know when the market will react to it. Mm-hmm. But uh, and he's saying even if it was a bear market, I think we'll be okay. So mm. I mean, he already. Kana is he maybe he thinks it's overvalued, but I think he's confident in his investment style that I think if he does protect his downside, I mean a bear market is just gonna be meaningless. Maybe he'll just buy yeah. more. I don't know. Mm. Alright, next pair. 
If the general market were to return to an undervalued status, our capital might be employed exclusively in general issues and perhaps some borrowed money would be used in this operation at that time. Conversely, if uh, the market should go considerably higher, our policy will be to reduce our general issues as profits present themselves and increase the workout portfolio. So what he's saying in this paragraph is if, if the market drops, he's willing to borrow money and invest. So I think he, he, he firmly believes in the cyclicality. Long term, mm -hmm. he thinks everything's going to go up. Mm -hmm. and, and he's trying to, I guess, uh, kind of take advantage of, of any cyclical downturn if they happen. Yeah. And he's, uh, if market goes up, he's willing to sell. I mean, yeah, he's, he's, you know, he wants to buy low, sell high and take profit and increase his workout portfolio. I think workouts are uh, are the spinoffs that, that Charlie Munger told Pabrai. So Pabrai famously, you know, said when he met with Munger when mm -hmm. after the Buffett's lunch, Munger gave him three tips. Mm -hmm. Tip number one, follow other good investors. See what they're buying, why they're buying it. Number two, invest in cannibals, people, companies that, that buy back their shares ferociously mm -hmm. and consistently. And third was pay attention to spin-offs. And this is whole what Greenblatt writes in his book and how to be a stock market genius. I mean, basically spin-offs and how, you know, smaller spin-offs where, where, you know, the big companies, big guys are not interested and, and, uh, and so supposedly easy money that, but, I don't know how easy it is. It may be easy for them, but but um, definitely something to explore if you're working with small sums of money and you are interested in value investing. And, and, and these workout are kind of like value investing, but they have events and catalysts that that uh, uh, can can give you the kind of more more certain returns. I guess is mm -hmm. the way to think about it. But read that book with Greenblatt by Greenblatt and. It, it I mean it, it's very bullish and it's, it's highly certain of its claims yeah so out of those three what, what does workouts here mean what would the spin-offs uh, okay so workouts is, is kind of spin-offs is, is basically kind of mergers and acquisition type activities and mm. or when a company spins out a branch like eBay spun out PayPal finally uh, and mm. that was in, in benefit for shareholders of of eBay because they also mm. got PayPal shares and now PayPal could grow without mm. uh, you know the overlying uh, management of eBay it could exist mm. on its own and, and with this one management and mm. grow faster so so that's okay. a spin-off example where it should be a win-win situation mm. so yep mm. interesting Honestly. All of the above is not intended to imply that market analysis is foremost in my mind. Primary attention is given at all times to the detection of substantially undervalued securities. Here he's telling you, you know, he doesn't want to time the market. Yep. Uh, he's kind of back of the mind maybe and, and mostly he's thinking about what to buy and what's undervalued and yep. he still loves Graham. I mean, he's and Graham is still alive. So mm. he's 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 follow for Graham through and through. Yep. So he's still kind of in that mindset of the cigarette yeah. butt mentality. Yeah. Okay. And it's highly profitable for him. So mm. the past year witnessed a moderate decline in stock prices. I stress the word moderate since casual reading of the press or conversing with those who have had only recent experience with stocks would tend to create an impression of a much greater decline. How actually, it appears to me that decline in net stock prices has been considerably less than the decline in corporate earning power under present business conditions. This means that the public is still very bullish on blue chip stocks and uh, general economic picture. I make no attempt to forecast either business or the stock market. The above is simply intended to dispel any notions that the stocks have suffered any drastic decline or that the general market is at a low level. I still, consider, I still consider the general market to be priced on the high side based on long-term investment value. I mean, he's 
uh, to kind of recap, I mean, he's telling you the market's gone low, uh, slightly lower, and uh, or moderately lower, but I think companies aren't making that much money anyway, so my market is stocks are kind of still overpriced compared to the actual earning power of, of you know, these blue chip companies, these big, you know, perfect businesses. Mm-hmm. Um, but he still thinks you know he wants to buy when it's cheap, and he doesn't. He's probably not finding a lot of cheap, undervalued security. So, so uh, two two questions that I have. So he thinks that um, since the majority of people, or maybe the market, thinks that it's a very bullish period on some of these stocks, what is what what does he mean by blue chip stocks here? And then. Um, I mean, he's not telling globally, I guess, what um, that that this will last for a very long period of time, right? Like, yeah, he I mean, saying? he's he's just saying that if having this, I mean, for a long-term investor, the the uh, then that's what Buffett is. A long-term investor, the assumption is you're buying today and you're gonna mm-hmm. hold for a long time and you're gonna sell later. Mm-hmm. So if you follow that mindset today, you want cheap cheap stocks and you want mm-hmm. them to be overvalued when you're going to sell them years later mm-hmm. you don't want to be, you don't want them to be overvalued today because you're a buyer today you want them to be mm-hmm. on sale you want mm-hmm. to be overvalued when you're a seller mm-hmm. so that's what he's saying he still thinks they're they're not they're down but they're really not cheap mm-hmm. you know okay. you like underlying if you look at underlying cash flow of the industries it, it's still the cash flow is much lower than the stocks have declined in, in prices. Okay, and blue chip stocks here? Where, so where, I think blue industry? chip is, is a poker term that, that's been derived into the investing world. Uh, blue chip is, is, I think, a poker chip that has a lot of value, and, mm-hmm. and, uh, uh, and that's taken to mean blue chip stocks are the, the most valuable companies, I mean, Think like today is you know S and P five hundred, but but not even those five hundred. Maybe maybe just the top, you mm. know, ten to one hundred companies. I mean the, mm. the 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 cream of the crop that are most profitable. Okay, not by any sector. Correct. Blue chip doesn't okay. imply a sector. I mean it could be that the tech, Google, Apple, Amazon, the Fang stocks, or it could. Coca-Cola. It could be Coca-Cola or Berkshire. I yeah. mean, those are all okay. kind of blue chip stocks. Nestle. I mean, these are the mono. I mean, they're they're probably never gonna die or die, you know, after many okay. many decades. Okay. All right. Next section. Our activities in 1957. The market decline has created greater opportunity among undervalued situations, so that generally. Our portfolio is heavier in undervalued situations relative to workouts than it was last year. Perhaps an explanation of the term workout is in order. A workout is an investment which is dependent on a specific corporate action for its profit rather than a general advance in the price of stock as in the case of uh, undervalued situations. Workouts come about through sales, mergers, liquidations, tenders, etc. In each case, the risk is that something will upset the apple cart and uh, cause the abandonment of the planned action. Not that the economic picture will deteriorate and the stock stocks decline generally. At the end of 1956, we had a ratio of about 70 to 30 between general issues and workouts. Now it is 85 to 15. Mm. So a little bit of a complicated paragraph. So he's yeah. he's trying to compare, you know, his classic value investing and and these workouts i think they are spin offs or, or special mm-hmm. corporate activity with a timetable where they have announcements or or things happening maybe they're selling things selling parts of businesses or issuing uh more securities or, or yeah. Uh, yeah like I, i'm guessing some type of activity in the business which relates to 
growth of the business. So it could be like sales, he's saying here, sales, mergers, liquidations, tenders. Um, so similar to what you were saying before with, uh, you know, Charlie's advice to a bride saying, hey, think about all these stocks. I mean, think about all these companies which have spinoffs because they might be there might be something interesting there. So he's kind of echo echoing that here. Um, what yeah. what I kind of am lost about here is he says, you know, this ratio between general issues and workout. So, so he's, he's telling you how he his capital allocation. So uh -huh. there, there are the non-workout part. I mean, he's traditionally, I think it looks like the year before, most of his portfolio, 70% was in undervalued uh, securities or undervalued stocks, I guess. Mm. And 30% was in this workout where he was tracking corporate activity. And, and he says, like, you know, the risk would be there's a planned merger and uh, and and you kind of participate in the security and anticipation that it will go through and it will be a profitable thing. Mm. But uh, the risk is that it doesn't happen. Like something happens and that that profitable event that was going to happen, it doesn't happen. Mm. And, uh, and, and then, you know, you will not be, you will not make money. You will not have that mm. profit. But he also mm. says, even if it doesn't happen, you know, the economic picture of the business is not going to change. I mean, the business is still going to continue. It's just, uh, but the stocks might decline because because people who are upset will sell. I mean, every time you have, you know, mass selling, partly motion or or for whatever reason, when you have mass kind of forced or semi forced selling, I mean, you'll have an opportunity. Mm -hmm. So maybe, maybe he's he's buying these after of uh, a planned event doesn't mm -hmm. happen you know and then there's that forced selling situation maybe he's picking those up yeah and and so really with the ratios sliding more toward this um uh, general issues compared to workouts does that mean that uh currently he he might think that these um workouts or these spin-offs or mergers or whatever it is these uh, he doesn't want to weigh too heavily in his portfolio, or, or he can't he's, find them. Or maybe. he's not finding them. I think yeah. it's probably he's not finding as many of them as okay. Because gotcha. I guess he's saying the companies, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe the corporate I mean, yeah. earnings are low, and maybe the corporate. Um, I mean, you you will yeah. notice that a lot a lot of these things happen. Uh, they're grouped for whatever. I I think that's my sense. Like one company yeah. does a spin off, then other companies wanna do cool things too too because mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. i mean that that's how like one person does something stupid and everybody wants to do something stupid so yeah that's manga yeah. would say i think yep makes <laughs> sense okay uh okay next para during the past year we have taken positions in two situations which have reached a size where we may expect to take some part in corporate decisions one of these positions accounts for between 10% and 20% of the portfolio of the various partnerships and the other accounts for about 5%. Okay. Uh, both of these will probably take in the neighborhood of five to three to five years of work, but they presently appear to have potential for a high average annual rate of return with the minimum of risk. While not in the classification of workouts, they have very little dependence on the general action of the stock market. Should the general market have substantial rise? Of course, I would expect this section of our portfolio to lag behind the action of the market. Mm -hmm. Okay, he's not naming anything, but he bought two things. Yep. That are he uh, uh, Buffett, uh, and he doesn't have one partnership. I think he he doesn't have one central partnership. I think it's more for decentralized structure mm -hmm. where he he has a special special agreement with each mm -hmm. uh, of his partners, quote unquote, individually. And he's talking about these these two positions. That the first position is so big that that it's between 10 to 20% of kind of all of his 
various partnerships mm. and the other one's five percent and in aggregate he owns enough you know stocks and ownership rights that he could actually be part of corporate decision making you know he could form mm. alliances if he wanted to if he wanted to and w what was interesting here i thought was that um you know he says I expect this section of our portfolio to lag behind the action of the market, meaning anything that has this kind of workout situation where it's huge sales, mergers, liquidation tenders, these ones are ahead of the market in terms of their values already priced into their stock price, right? Is Am I reading that right? Where, um, you know, these, these could be considered as growth companies, and so the, the P ratio is going to be pretty high since their uh, growth is I'm already not factored sure about into that. stock price. Repeat no? what you're trying to say. So, so you know, I'm trying to figure out why he's saying here. Um, he expects that um, this this uh, workout, these workout situations, or these workout companies, to lag behind the market if the market overall appreciates. Well, these two situations are not workouts. Oh no! Oh okay, I completely yeah, yeah, misunderstood yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, it says like the last uh, line on this on this page. I mean, these are just. I wanna. I don't even know if these are stocks because he. This seems like there's a maturity in three to five years. He's very certain, or maybe it's just such a predictable business that that he is has minimal risk, and he's pretty certain in three to five years he will have pretty high average annual rate of return. Mm -hmm. uh, it's possible it's a bond and not even a, a, a stock, but uh, it probably is a stock uh, of a highly predictable business. And then he says these are not workouts. Okay. Oh, these are not uh, workouts. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So these are not workouts, but then they will. Um, the, but these then, have enough intrinsic value where but they, they have very little dependence on the general action of the stock market. Maybe they're so small, or or they are not stocks, or maybe they're preferred stocks, or some uh, yeah. that they have they mature after three to five years, and then maybe it's these are kind of corporate bonds, or or I guess they're later called junk bonds. Yeah. And if the if the market does increase, of course, then he will lag behind the market. But he found yep. these these kind of low risk, high rate of return uh, situations. Mm -hmm. I would love if you could name these, man. So, I know, so I know. Private. I wonder, I wonder if he will in the next few, um, you well, know, maybe, uh, maybe as he sells pages. them. Okay, yeah. results. Here we go. Results of 1957. In 1957, the three partnerships which we formed in 1956 did substantially better than the general market. At the beginning of the year, the Dow Jones Industrial stood at 499. And at the end of the year, it was about 435 for a loss of 64 points. Mm. If one had owned the averages, he would have received 22 points in dividends, reducing the overall loss, loss to 42 points, or 8.4% for the year. This loss is roughly equivalent to what would have been achieved by investing in most investment funds and to my knowledge no investment fund invested in stocks showed a gain for the year so it's saying all the i guess investment funds were down the dow was down which is kind of which is the index so okay. everything was down except for buffett probably that's it <laughs> all three of the 1956 partnerships showed a gain during the year amounting to about 6.2%, 7.8%, and 25% on year-end 1956 net worth. Well, there's significant variation in these partnerships, looks like. Mm. Okay. Yeah. All right, naturally, a question is created as to the vastly superior performance of the last partnership. Okay. Particularly mm. in the mind of the partners of the first two. See, I mean, he's like, he's thinking. He's like, okay, you're reading, and you're like, why is the third one 25 percent but the first two are 6.2 and 7.8 yeah. and yeah. and you know and and if you're one of the partners who owns the first two you're like hey man what the heck yeah, why, why, yeah. How, how come we got left behind you know <laughs> <laughs> 
And this so he, they put in less basically. Is that what you're well, saying? Well, he's gonna let's see what he says. Yeah. This performance emphasizes the importance of luck in the short run, uh, particularly in regard to when funds are received. The third partnership was started the latest in uh, 1956 when the market was at a lower level and when several securities were particularly attractive. Because of the availability of funds, large positions were taken in these issues. Whereas the two partnerships formed earlier were already substantially invested so that they could only take relatively small positions in these issues. So he's still talking about those two things that he bought and, and the first partnership probably didn't have as much cash. So he bought mm -hmm. a little bit and then he bought a lot with the third one because that was all new money. Yeah, they got lucky. So, so uh, can we pause there for a second? So, what's he talking about when he's talking about these partnerships? Like, so I don't understand his structure. It looks like he yeah. he has. It's not very centralized. I think I think maybe that's why he gets frustrated, at least maybe partly, and then shuts it all down and, and just does it in a centralized manner with Berkshire. Because so mm -hmm. I don't know. He's keeping track with three different part. Because I don't think I don't think Pabri does it like that. No, I don't think a lot maybe. of people. Nick Sleep didn't do it like that. I think he just. I think they just held on to your money and they didn't start the clock till they could invest it for you. you know? Maybe it's something like, um, you know how multiple people invested in his firm? So maybe it could be something like, hey, these guys who are early investors, they get, uh, you know, class A shares or whatever, and then these guys get different no, ones. I, I no, I think it's, it's, it's just, I think he's super, I mean, he's 27. I oh, mean, yeah, that's right. He's just like, I mean, he's smart. He knows corporate finance, and he know, he he could probably set up a complicated structure to do the investing if he wanted to. But yeah. he's a friends and family. I think he's just like, I think people are like, "Hey, we want to invest with you," and he's like, "Well, okay, let me see who else is interested, and I'll just create." Because he he doesn't want to put that cash and dilute the other thing that's already set mm -hmm. up. Because because mm -hmm. he may not be once he get the cash, then he has to find something to invest into. Yeah. And yeah. if he doesn't, it dilutes everybody else's returns. So I think mm -hmm. he just he just keeps creating more and more partnerships as he gets more and more money and as people, you know, he gets popular yeah. in, in Central America or, you know, Middle America. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, next pair. Basically, all partnerships are invested in the same securities and approximately the same percentages. However... Mm -hmm. Particularly during the initial stages, money becomes available at varying times and varying levels of the market, so there is more variation results than is likely to be the case in later years. Over the years, I will be quite, quite satisfied with the performance that is 10% per year, better than the averages. <laughs> so in respect to these three partnerships, 1957 was successful and probably better than average year. So, so saying, yeah, yeah, is he kind of gloating that uh, he's reached more than 10% this year? I don't think he's gloating. He's like, it was successful, but I think he's just classically kind of telling you, don't expect this, right? For 56, mm. 70 years, he's been like, we have done great, but these returns cannot be replicated. So, <laughs> so this is the start. Even when he was twenty-seven, yeah. oh, that's so cool. He's yeah, like, hey man, like, oh, oh, yeah. our goal is ten percent above average. This was a fluke that we just did. So, yeah. So we'll probably never do this again. <laughs> and he, okay. they continue to, you know, surprise themselves for what, like fifty years? I don't know. Right. It's just, right. It's ridiculous. God, I wish I was alive so I could buy a share. Oh, that'd be great. <laughs> or, or set up a partnership. Mm -hmm. Two partnerships were started during the middle of 1957, and their results for the balance of the year were roughly the same as the performance of the average, which were down about 12% for the period since the inception of the 1957 partnerships. Their portfolios are now starting to approximate those are the 1956 partnerships and performance of the entire group should be much more comparable in the future okay mm -hmm. so i guess more people wanted to give him money market went down so those are actually down like the market 
Mm-hmm. Uh, but he tells them it's short term, long term, they should all go in sync. So mm-hmm. it's all luck. It's all luck. But one thing is cool. I mean, interesting. You know, he, he seems to not hold on to cash very much. I mean, he seems to get cash and invest whatever yeah. is available. But he doesn't have that much right now, I guess. I, I mean, mean, whenever he gets something, he okay. figure out what to invest and then he invests. Whatever yeah. the best yeah. available opportunities. I mean, mm-hmm. as opposed to just sitting on cash for two, three years. Yeah. Like, he's not doing yeah. that. I don't know if he's got, he's doing the, the strategy of his that he's following that's very uh, thoughtful or mm-hmm. he's just, like, trying just not to worry about timing the market. He's just like, I'm not going to buy something. And just move on. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I mean, opportunity cost of not playing whatever available is probably high. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that makes sense. So I, all the cash that he has is pretty much invested right now. Is that right? So he doesn't yeah, have that and, much and, cash. Yeah, yeah. It's like if the market's cheap, he buys stuff. If the market's kind of overvalued, he buys the cheapest things he can find. I think that's mm-hmm. what's happening. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's mm-hmm. a lesson for us, little people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe don't sit too much in cash waiting for a sale. I mean. Do your best, but more, more often than not, kind of stay in the market. Mm. Maybe. Interesting. Maybe. Okay. And like you know, like how this year is like stock market is a bit lower, and because the the the, the profits are lower, mm-hmm. I wonder if that's going to be like upcoming years. You know, as supply chain issues and and all the internet company that it boosted and come boomed in COVID maybe calm down maybe their stock prices will calm down I don't know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. then we can be like I read in Buffett's letter that you know this happened so <laughs> <laughs> this is deja vu <laughs> all right uh, interpretation of results okay, yeah interpretation of results is the next section to some extent our better than average performance in 957 was due to the fact that it was a generally poor year for most stocks our performance relatively is likely to be better in a bear market than in a bull market so the deductions made from the above results should be tempered by the fact that it was a type of year when we should have done relatively well in a year when the general market has substantially advanced I would be well satisfied to match the advance of the averages. This is so interesting. This is actually that's so cool. This is what Nick Sleep says in his letters early on hmm. that we are value investors. Mm-hmm. In the bear markets, you should expect us to beat the market, and in bull markets, you know if we can just keep up, that's great. Mm-hmm. That's that's like the value investing, like Howard Marks, like all these people. This is their mantra mm-hmm. that we want to beat the market during barriers. Yeah, Downers. and it even now that's the case. Like like all if you, I think the S and P is now even now is is I mean I don't know for the few past years how Buffett has done, but now that we're in this kind of bullish market, it's probably doing better in terms of percentage returns than. Buffett's um, yeah, I bet, I bet they're, yeah, it's 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 difficult for these value investors to keep up. Yeah, with these you know future earning, uh, high market cap companies in the index that are you know that are growing and uh, and yeah. and pulling the index with them and then they're getting yeah. left behind. What's awesome about this also is that. Um, Averages matter, like long periods of, um, uh, of of like the agglomeration of larger years, the time span, the averages really matter. Like anyone could be hot a year, anyone could be hot two, three years, but to be consistently hot, which, which has to mean that during like, uh, you know, bearish markets, your averages are going to be doing better than the S&P 500. So then, you know, your average overall, even though you weren't as bullish, um, are going to end up being better. So you'll end up having a better return. Oh, yeah, exactly, um, exactly. I mean, if you're yeah. matching it during, you know, bullish years and you're yeah. beating it during bear's year, bearish years, then on average you're doing above average. Yeah. That's right, that's and, right, and yeah. That's why, they, you know, you deserve the investor's money and that's that's why you are 
a, a you know you will you'll beat the market consistently All right that's and it, you know and you know what, what else is awesome about this paragraph is that um, right now you hear it, it's like, ah, oh, Buffett's this old guy, whatever, he doesn't know what he's talking about, look at all these crazy growth stocks that are happening. And of course, if you read this paragraph, it's very obvious, he's not trying to do better than those guys, he's just saying, you know, as long as I get to just the average of what these these kind of high and low people are doing, then I'm super happy. It's just difficult, man. Doing average yeah. of 15, 16 percent. I mean, what? Uh, like, this is 2021, and S and P 500 is up. I mean, above 20 percent. Yeah. And I mean, it's all by Fang stocks, which still have like you know an average PE of above 30. I mean. Yeah. If you can, I mean, PE is still you know it's it's, it's not the best metric, but it, I mean, it still makes sense, especially when you're profitable internet companies. Yeah. So I mean, it's it's, and I think only the reason Buffett is or Berkshire is keeping up now is I mean they have significant Apple. Apple. I mean that's. Uh, yeah. I don't know if it's. I think, I, I don't know. If they love the fact that they have Apple because it's it's stock price. Probably gonna fluctuate. I mean, it's just a tech yeah. company, and only the tech company Buffett was able to purchase. You know, psychologically was IBM, and I mean, we know how that's gonna turn out. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so I mean, it's uh it's interesting uh, to see. I mean, it's interesting yeah. to see that same kind of questions are in everybody's mind, you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago. I mean, it's, That's right. it's the same kind of stuff. Hey, man, like, market's down. Oh, oh yeah, Buffett's beating it. And, you know, market's mm-hmm. up. Oh, look, these value invest- investor people are idiots. You know, they don't know yeah. anything. And, Mm. And this time it's different. Let's buy Pets.com. Mm. Let's buy Yahoo. Yeah. Let's buy you know, okay, this, this is a question for you then. If that's the case, then should you be following um, these market gurus? Because if it's a very uh, optimistic kind of bullish period, shouldn't you be on the other train saying, hey, man, you know, these guys aren't, this is not the right time to emulate these high value investors. Perhaps I mean theoretically, you know, during bearish markets, you you emulate, you know, the, the you know the the value guys, and during you know like Buffett and Howard Marks and uh, Nick Sleep, and during the bullish, you know, and the positive growth, you you do, you know, uh, and recent. I mean, like you know these, mm-hmm. these uh, mm-hmm. VC, VC players, guys. and then mm-hmm. there, you know, Peter Thiel and uh, mm-hmm. Chamath. I mean. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's it's difficult. I mean, most of these people. I mean, VC players. I mean, their exit strategy is the IPO. I mean, yeah, <laughs> they're they're selling to us. I mean, like you know, yeah. like yeah. It's, it's it's it'll be interesting if we could. You know, maybe we could was yeah. an angel list or something that Naval has created. Yeah, maybe we should start looking at that because I think but, Uber Uber went through that. But yeah, the risk there is that we don't know when the bullish period will end. So of course, I mean your timing too. Maybe, I mean, yeah, like, yeah what is and like, right, and, right, and and uh, it's easier to predict performance based on a business that has a track record of yeah being a good business and yep. also has uh, low change yeah as as a factor yeah that's I mean, right that is that is noble as certainty. It's yep. difficult to predict these pre-revenue, you know, pre-profitable companies that yep. paint a rosy future because yep. nobody knows the future, right? Except yep. for Buffett, of course. But <laughs> <laughs> so, so okay, okay. Next para, I can certainly say that our portfolio represents better value at the end of 1957 than it did at the end of 1956. This is due to both generally lower prices and the fact that we have had more time to acquire the more substantially undervalued securities which can only be acquired with patience. So the market is down and he's like, ah, our, our portfolio is amazing. We, we bought so much of these sale things and and uh, our portfolio is so much, so much better now. We got more bang for our money. We're doing awesome. Mm-hmm. 
earlier I mentioned our largest position, which comprised 10 to 20% of the assets of various partnerships. Uh, in time, I plan to have this represent 20% of the assets of all partnerships, but this cannot be hurried. So he wants to increase that position even more, but he's mm -hmm. like, I'm not gonna just buy it. I'm gonna buy the dip. That's how I'm gonna build this position. Buy the dip. Mm -hmm. like, That's interesting. Maybe we should do that. <laughs> <laughs> Seems do. easy. Yeah, buy the dip. <laughs> In time, I plan to have this position. Uh, I have yeah, to plan. Yeah, this. in time, I plan to have this represent twenty percent of the assets of all partnerships. But this cannot be hurried. Obviously, during my acquisition period, our primary interest is to have the stock do nothing or decline rather than advance. Therefore, at any given time, a fair proportion of our portfolio maybe in the sterile stage this policy would require with while requiring patience should maximize long-term profit okay what did he say there he is saying when he builds a position he does it slowly mm -hmm. and when he buys he wants the stock to go down or stay the same he does not want stock to go up because mm -hmm. he wants to buy more yeah I mean that is not how most people invest. They buy but something. Why, yeah. Yeah. When they're when they're low, right? They just buy a, a whole bunch. But why why is he kind of prescribing why would he want to buy slowly? Well, he wants to buy maybe he has enough money that if he buy or cuz he I think he's certainly dabbling in uh smaller markets. I don't think he's mm -hmm. buying blue chips. He's buying small mm -hmm. cap companies. Mm. And he may have enough money that if he bought a whole lot, he would increase the price. It's certain mm. possible that the companies he's buying, that he needs to build slowly. That's the only mm. way he can he can actually build a position. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's a philosophical question. When you have conviction, you have prices right, do you build... Do you just buy it or do you dollar cost average or do you just buy the dip? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think Munger would disagree with this strategy. I think Munger would be like, here, price is right, company is fine. I don't care about super, super cheap prices. I think fair price is fine, business is good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, just leave me alone. I just want to read my books. You know, like, mm -hmm. I don't want to, you know, I don't, yeah. don't want to waste time trying to yeah. build a position if I can just do it in a lump sum. Yeah. Makes sense. But either way, I mean, a decline is after you, you know, when, when you're in the sale period, acquisition period, you know, mm -hmm. or, or, or or plateauing, a stock plateauing is not an issue for Buffett. Yeah. And maybe this is a good lesson from Buffett in that um, he's saying, you know, if it goes down, that's great. Like, just buy more. You yeah. should have enough conviction when you buy it the first time around. That Correct. you should buy more when when maybe you're create lower. a buffer. Like if it goes down, like what will you do? Maybe you'll buy more. Yeah, and yeah. then and he has long term uh, mindset. I mean, he's he's clearly you know this all means that you yeah know, he he wants when he's a buyer he wants stocks to be cheap. He, he, yep. and he's he's not in a rush to be rich. Yeah. Okay, last uh, little para. I have tried to cover points which I felt might be of interest and disclose as much of our philosophy as may be imparted without talking of individual issues. I wish he was not like this. I wish, yeah, just, just <laughs> mention the companies, man. Come on, if there are any, shareholders. <laughs> if there are any questions concerning any phase of the operation, I would welcome hearing from you. Oh my god. Interesting. So annoying. Yeah. So, selfish. so, so uh, you know, he does change his mind about disclosing the public companies later on, as we know. You know, he, in his later letters, he's going to say specific names of companies that he bought or, or whichever. But uh, well, for not some really, reason, not really. He's, he's doing that. In um, Berkshire Hathaway, right? Is yeah. What talking about yeah, yeah, a publicly yeah. traded company. Oh, so he, he may. 
have to. That's right. Okay, so it's private right now. Yeah, this is all. This is a private part. That's right. That's right. Okay, okay. Wow, we're really going back. This is so cool. So this is like being one of the family members and getting one of these letters, really. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You, you can't. Only way to get into this is, is Buffett likes you. That's the yeah. only way you'll get, get into these yeah. partnerships. Yeah. Okay, very cool. Wow. Very, very cool. Um, yeah, so this concludes the 1957 letter. Yeah. And it would be great if we had the 1956 letter, which was the very, very first letter. But um, yeah, we'll have to end it there. All right. Uh, again, you know, go find the 1956 letter, guys. Go yeah, on the please. internet. I don't know. Go on the dark web if you need to. Go to Buffett's yeah. house if you can. <laughs> and just, just ask him for the letter. <laughs> if it still has a copy. He may be like, I don't know where I put it. I think I had a McDonald on it and then, you know, it, it got oil stains and it threw it away. He, he was 26 <laughs> at the time, so yeah, I guess oh my it, God. this I don't is know as what early happened. as we can yeah. get. Like, yeah. I don't even know what my papers are from last year. I mean, Yeah, I don't even know if I, I knew how to write, let alone write letters. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Awesome. Uh, see you next time. See you next time in 1958. All right.